Hello and welcome back, everybody, to the DanJohnUniversity.com podcast, and welcome back. Reminder, if you have questions, email them to us at podcast at DanJohnUniversity.com. I'll do my best to answer each and every one, and I really appreciate the questions. Uh, I sometimes remind people that, so we're, we're, plus of all the other materials, I do uh, Q&As and all these other things. Very often, we've answered the same questions over and over. And it's, of course, my goal is that the answers are all pretty much the same. But if you do have a question that you feel like I didn't ask, there's a good chance it's already, you know, somewhere else. Uh, use your Google, use your search engines to find those questions. Uh, we have a lot of good questions today. Uh, today is a good day for questions. And uh, I'm particularly excited about this first question. Uh, this first question and uh, it's it's a pretty easy one for me to answer, but I really appreciate it because we can really expand from it. Uh, RJ asks, uh, and I won't read the whole thing to you, but basically I have programs on Dan John University like uh, for easy strength for Olympic lifting, easy strength for fat loss with Olympic lifting, uh, various uh, programs for Olympic lifting in there that are all pretty simple. They're They're generally... Uh, you know, I was joking the other day, someone got on me online about the way I coach the Olympic lifts. Okay, if you're the silver medalist at the Olympics and you're trying to add 10 kilos to your, your lift, you know, you're, you're clean and jerking uh, 220 and you want to get to 230, yeah, maybe I'm not the guy to talk to. Uh, you know, there might be better and brighter people and I probably don't even speak your language, so that wouldn't really help you that much anyway. But if you're a general enthusiast, if you're using the Olympic lifts for sports, if you're using the Olympic lifts for, well, for general conditioning, like I think still has a value, then I, I think I can help you. So in my programs, RJ's found a very good small issue. And the issue is this. I tend to have like in one of the programs, I think, let's just say, I think it's Wednesday. And it says Wednesday, squat, snatch, three sets of three. There's, a, there's other things too. And then it says three singles in the clean and jerk. Well, if you do the math, that's nine snatches, but only three clean and jerks. And he began to notice that I, I do that a lot. Well, the reason I like this question is it does kind of crack open uh, a, a bigger question, and that's the whole question of reps. And uh, the quick answer is this. <laughs> well, there's, and there's two parts. First, late in my career as an Olympic lifter when I was good. Now, I still Olympic lift, but I mean, Frankly, you know, <laughs> my goal now is the clean and jerk 105 kilos, which is 231. Um, of course, at 865, that's good. But, you know, I used to clean 182.5, which is 402. Uh, I've done 385, 175 kilos many, many, many times in meets. Uh, so, uh, you know, things have, things have changed just things have changed a little bit on the load side. Uh, the, 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 there's a couple other points, but let me, let me say focused on RJ's question. When I see the clean and jerk, when I was young and I would do those heavy 175 kilo clean and jerks in training, I put the weight down, I breathe. And I began to notice over time, I couldn't recover from those lifts. So late in my career, I quit doing clean and jerks, except at contests, part two. I would clean in training, I would do jerks in training, and I'd only clean and jerk in competition because it took so long for me to recover from. And then the second major point would be this, is the clean and jerk is two movements. So in a sense, when you're doing three singles, in a sense, when you're doing three singles in a clean and jerk, you're doing kind of doubles in a certain way. And I know that that doesn't make a lot of sense until you, know, you make certain lifts or you train a long time. But here's what I want you to think about, is when we look at all the world of lifting, reps change not only by the movement, but by the also by the equipment. Um, whereas, I have this thing called the 10,000 swing challenge. It's a great thing. 20 days, 500 swings a day, pretty doable because the kettlebell swing and the kettlebell snatch really work well with high repetition training. 
Um, you can do, well, I have a, we do one thing with, with the people getting ready for the kettlebell cert where they do 300 snatches in one day. Basically, it's three sets of 100. That's a lot of volume. Uh, you know, 500 swings. That's a lot of volume. As I step back, I look at some other exercises, and I guess you could do uh, 500 swing, uh, probably squats in a day. You could do 500 deadlifts in a day. I'm just not sure it would really have much value. I mean, it might be nice for a little challenge or some way to stay, you know, keep your keep yourself lubricated on a road trip, you know, keep your joints feeling good or whatever. But no one seriously does uh, those kinds of workouts. Uh, I mean, I know people do them and I get that. So when you look at things like the ballistic kettlebell world, high reps are appropriate. Now let's bring in machines. Uh, if you're doing leg extensions, and I'm a big fan of leg extensions, leg curls, uh, there's different row and uh, pull down machines I think have great value. There are some press machines I think have some great value. Um, there's that one, uh, there's a company that has this row machine that actually really feels good. Um, I used to have a membership over, over at one of the clubs in Salt Lake. And uh, I, when I recover from injuries, I love doing machine training. Machine training, to me, lends itself to, you know, those higher reps. If I'm doing an exercise like leg curls, I like to use Art Devaney's idea of you do a set of 15 slow, then you do it, it, and then you change pins and go right back a set of eight medium, and then you put a heavier load on real heavy load, and you try to ugh, get three, four, five reps any way you possibly can. You know, I like that. I don't know if I've ever seen anyone do that. You know, like with front squats. You know, uh, 135 for 15. 225 for eight, 315 for as many. I, I, I mean, it might work. I don't know if I would do it. So you've got the kettlebell ballistics, high reps. You've got the machine world, higher reps. Uh, and there's lots of reasons for it. The machines very often take care of your balance. And you can, you know, you can push harder with one arm. You can have a lot more shaking with the machines. When you move into the exercises like the Olympic lifts and the power lifts, and I'll use Dave Davis's classic six here, the clean and press, the snatch, the clean and jerk, the Olympic lifts, and then the power lifts, power lifts, squat, bench press, and deadlift. Generally, you find if you're going heavy, you don't have a ton of reps. Uh, Stefan Court, the great German powerlifting coach, and he used to have that three sets of three program, which I thought was really a good idea in the three power lifts in, in Somebody wanted to explain it to me as the three by three by three by three program, three days a week, three lifts, three sets of three. You know, you're looking around a total of less than 10 reps. Years ago, I came up with this concept I called the rule of 10 is that when you're lifting on those big engine lifts, and uh, I would include um, all six of those exercises, and I have an asterisk before we go too far, is that. You know, if you can do 10 heavy squat snatches in a workout, you're done. Um, 10 clean and jerks would be really hard, I think. Um, serious 10 deadlifts. I, I never don't think I could ever do it. One of my favorite stories was at the uh, the big uh, Olympic uh, powerlifting meet that I did in 1980 here in, in Utah. And the uh, <laughs> getting ready backstage, uh, Greg Shepard from Bigger, Faster, Stronger and I, we're the only two people left in the warm-up room. And he said, uh, what are you going to open with? And I said, I don't know. I go, what are you going to open with? And he said a number. And I said, oh, I'll just go heavier. And uh, because I had never, ever trained on the deadlift, because A, I'm born to hinge, and I'm an Olympic lifter, so the deadlift's pretty easy. And about 10, 15 years later, he was telling the story. Yeah, I was with this guy one time at a powerlifting meet, and he didn't even know what he was going to open with on the deadlift. And I go, I go, Greg, that was me. He goes, and it was just kind of one of those funny things because we knew each other, but you know, sometimes you bump into people and you re-meet them later, and you, but you don't remember every story. I said, there's an asterisk and here's the asterisk on reps. With the squat though, things are different. The rules do change with the squat, which makes the squat for me sometimes the most dangerous of all exercises to talk about. Uh, with the squat, if you're a, a thrower or an Olympic lifter, 
uh, generally you keep those squat numbers down. Uh, if you're a if you're a, if you're a power lifter, you might say, "I'm not squatting, you know, five sets of five. I'm going to do, you know, I'm going to do triples, doubles, singles, or, or whatever you try. It doesn't matter." Yet for hypertrophy, high rep back squats with heavy weights is the, probably the single best thing I ever coached uh, for back squats. Um, years ago, I got good advice from one of our national Olympic lifting coaches. He was watching the way I was training. He said that I should never do any less than 10 reps in the back squat because the way I was built and the way I was moved, heavy back squats didn't carry at all over to what I was doing on the platform. Funny thing is that coach was right. And I was a little stubborn at the time to take good advice from other coaches. That was a mistake. I later, I started doing tens in the back squat and higher and I thrived on those higher rep back squats. So back squats, they get their own number. So what I'm trying to get across is this. Sometimes when you pick an exercise, you've got to step back before you say, I'm doing reps and sets with this. If you told me you're doing five sets of two in the kettlebell swing, that would make no sense to me at all. Kettlebell swings, kettlebell ballistics, those are much higher rep numbers. Uh, when you get to exercises like on the machines, those would be more in that 15 to 25 reps being obviously eights are great, tens are great. Ten, there are no bad numbers, but you can do more reps on machines. When it comes to the six traditional, the Olympic lifts and power lifts, generally the reps are the rule of 10 or less with the asterisk of the squat, because you can do high rep squat squats and you can do those heavy grinding singles and get benefits out of both for some people. So when I look at an exercise like the clean and jerk, RJ, I generally, for most adults, I separate out the two lifts mentally and count that as each rep is a double, even though you're cleaning it and jerking it. When it comes to reps and sets in the weight room, you always have to remember what equipment am I using? Kettlebells, ballistics, higher reps, machines, those hypertrophy numbers, the big power lifts and Olympic lifts, the rule of 10. And that's a simple little formula I just came, I gave you, but it seems to be true most of the time for most people. And most of the time for most people is uh, a pretty good thing to kind of remember. Good. So our next question is from Lance. And Lance asks us, on the podcast, you've mentioned many times that you, your old throws coach, Coach Ralph Mon, recommended lifting three days a week and throwing four days a week for the next eight years. Yeah, exactly right. I am wondering if you think a similar plan would be beneficial for baseball football players to increase running speed and throwing speed. Easy strength type workouts, squat, press, pull for three days a week, and throwing, sprinting, jumping the other four days. You you also mentioned Barry Ross's work for improving speed, but he generally recommends higher intensity on his programs, 85% plus. Uh, just real quick, I'm going to answer that last question first. Barry uh, had his athletes, his sprinters, do sumo deadlifts, and they always dropped the bar at the top. And really towards the end, it was just a hinge. It was a loaded hinge. with the, with the, He never allowed the eccentric. Uh, also, these were sprinters, so they're 85%. Uh, really still weren't extraordinarily big deadlifts. Uh, you know, if you have a high school girl deadlifting uh, 200 pounds, which is not unusual at all, uh, 90 kilos, you know, 85% of that is, uh, I should have picked a better number. You know, it's in, it's in the high hundreds. It's not, a, it's not a very big lift, what, 175, 170, something like that. It's not a, it's not a massive number that's going to cripple anybody. Um, strong for a, a sprinter, not strong for, you know, a thrower, American football player, rugby player. I like that. So he's asking, you know, honestly, and, and, and Lance, as I stop and think about this even more, uh, it, in my perfect world, every athlete would lift weights three days a week and perform their sport four days a week. That to me, um, 
you know, in the off season, you would lift Monday, Wednesday, Friday, because that works in my brain. Uh, you would do your sport uh, Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday. So Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday are sports or sprinting or jumping or throwing only. And Monday is the only day we have to have that conversation of, you know, doing both on one day with Wednesday and Friday being lift only and Sunday being a day of rest. I just invented Sunday as a day of rest. You're welcome. Yeah, I think there's great value in it, Lance. I think one of the issues that happens is when I was young, that is how people trained. It's what they did. And it does help to have more training sessions per, per day, per week, per month, per year, per decade. It does. The more training sessions you can get, the better. But the mistake we're making, at least in the American side of things, is that we're trying to cram eight years into eight weeks. And I think it's a much more successful idea. And in fact, you can stick with the eight there too. I think you should do that about eight months of the year and either take two full months off or break up, you know, a short, you know, maybe a I don't know, like do something like I, I, I do now. I take off six weeks a year from my norm, and then I sprinkle in a week or two of serious deloading in the rest of the year. And that serious deloading is usually, you know, going to Europe or, you know, going to Hawaii or going on a trip or whatever. I, and I just don't train that week. It might be better to train, you know, those eight months, take the six weeks, two weeks, and then on those those other two months of the year, I'm sorry, I skipped it in the earlier, on those other two months of the year, either that is, depending on how good you are, either that's your competition peak or that's that deep off-season training. We used to call it getting in shape, but it's when you try to build up a, a foundation of qualities and then after that two months, six to, six to eight weeks, however it works out in your system. And that's, by the way, during those during that during this foundation building program this is a good time to play another sport um, almost universally almost universally i recommend volleyball volleyball is a great off-season sports lots of jumping lots of laughing lots of you know it's competitive there's an indoor sport called volleyball that might be valuable so you got that you, know, you got that foundational building this is a good time to do some cross-country running or even cross-country hiking, biking, kayaking, whatever, you know. Uh, in the weight room, not necessarily a good time of year to Olympic lift, but it's a real good time to hit those machines. It's a good time of year to work on that flexibility program you read online. It's a good time of year to try that thing you saw that person do that sounded like a good idea and rarely, rarely, rarely is. So, uh Eight months a year, you're, you're going to do this very boring three days a week weightlifting program, four, four days a week of doing your sport. Yeah, over eight years, you're going to get good. Throw in some time off, off, just totally off. Throw in some prep time or peak time, depending on what your sport's like. You know, when I work with professional baseball here in the United States, uh, we have one program that we do. Uh, and uh, I mean, there's nothing. There's nothing fancy about it, but it's an easy strength hybrid. But the program goes uh, week one, A, B, A. A and B are the, 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 the organization of the exercises. They're, they change a little bit. A, B, A. Week two, B, A, B. Two weeks, right? Well, with Major League Baseball, it might take six or seven weeks to do those two weeks because of the travel, injuries, exhaustion. Uh, literally in some cases, like things like heat stroke. And, um, you know, I had a buddy explain to me the problem with being a major league baseball player is putting on your uniform 162 times. And that's just the regular season is exhausting. <laughs> just putting on your gear that many times. And don't forget, they have preseason, they have playoffs, they have World Series, they have this, they have that. So, yeah, I honestly think, Lance, that that's the best way to go. Lance's question is simple. Coach Mon says to me, the secret, lift three days a week, throw four days a week for the rest of your career. Does that work in every other sport? Yes, but here's what you're gonna miss. Trying to cram 
those eight years into eight days, eight weeks, eight months, ain't going to work. You've got to take the time, and that is seriously almost a decade worth of commitment and training. I think the fastest route to get strong is the slow route, but no one wants to hear that. Good question, Lance. Okay, we've got a question from Mark. Mark is a, a retired military guy, uh, United States Marine. You don't retire from the Marines. Um, he's in his mid-50s. He's just a baby, because I always say that when people are in their 50s. Multi deployments, lots of jujitsu, shoulder surgery, broken ribs, torn a MCL, and now heading in for a total hip replacement, anterior. Oh, okay. Oh, anterior. Okay. Uh, I watch all your podcasts on hip replacement uh, and to repair. I started the 40-day push-pull program for easy strength. I'll compete 20 days before my surgery. I like this guy. Thank you, Mark. So I try to get into my surgeries in the best shape I, uh, I can be. Sometimes I'm, I'm still bloated and red because of all the, uh, when you're in pain all the time, your body kind of inflames and I get red. I, I get really red right here when I'm in pain all the time. But get in the best shape you can before surgery. And so that when you come out on the other side, you've got a little bit of momentum still. Um, I will complete 20 days before surgery. Okay. I should have started sooner. You're fine. But I rediscovered it watching your podcast and I thought it'd be a great way to re, uh, prehab my body. And I agree. My goals are to continue being active into my 80s or 90s. I'd say even longer. My surgeon said I can return to most activities, but the only two he cautioned against were running, jogging. Yeah, and that's true. You know, uh, I don't, I want to stop here for just a second, Mark, and just say the problem with running is that if you're my body weight, I believe it's 20, 2,600 foot pounds of pressure every time my foot hit strikes the ground when I'm running. And that really adds up quickly to be a lot of stress and strain on, on the systems. So, yeah. And, and, oh, and the doctor also said uh, lifting heavy. Uh, I certainly don't want to wear out my new hip prematurely. Questions. Can I expect to achieve my previous lifts or even get stronger? Well, I mean, six months after a total hip replacement, I flipped a caber that was considered impossible. So you, know, you, can, you can be like me and, you know, do the impossible. Uh, how long before you were lifting heavy? Uh, that's okay. Any A, okay, now. And then, the, okay, so what I did first and foremost is do whatever your doctor says, do whatever your physical therapist says. That's very important. I was lucky. I have friends like Tim Anderson. So I was doing original strength, you know, heck, even in the hospital bed, you know, I was making sure I was getting my, as appropriate, I was, you know, you're wired up completely, except I could move my neck. So I was just doing some gentle neck movements. Post surgery, within I mean, I mean, I, I mean, I woke up and I bet you within you know twenty minutes I was already doing that stuff. Um, I started doing uh, six point rocks very soon after my second surgery, especially, and as soon as you can walk, walking and six point rocks, in in my estimation, uh, th th those are the peas and carrots of uh, total hip replacement rehab. Uh, to quote my good friend Forrest Gump. As for lifting, I took my time. And one of the reasons it'll make sense why I'm telling you this, Mark, later on, uh, I started doing suspension trainer squats, and I noticed that I had a death grip on it as I was going down. That's because, you know, a whole bunch of your brain is saying, you know, we have metal in our legs now. This is bad, and, and that's okay. I was probably doing assisted squats within weeks or months uh, easily. Uh, I did an Olympic lift for almost an entire year. So I didn't, I didn't do the snatch and the clean for an entire year after either time. But if, if you're not feeling right with the modern total hip replacement, let's just say, okay, I, I can't give medical advice, but if you don't feel right after one year at post, then I don't know. Either, either something in the back of your head needs a conversation 
or you're really in worse shape than you might have thought, or there might be an issue, or another five other ors. You know, I feel like I'm rowing right now. <laughs> or? Okay. Uh, but this question here, any asymmetrical issues uh, lifting with the new hip, um, and, and, he asks, and he asks if there's any correctives. This is going to sound weird, but I feel fortunate in the fact that both of my hips are THRs. Uh, um, the thing uh, my good friend Coach Steve-O said to me, we're at the discus camp, and we're going down for the next session, and someone said, do you want to do you want to ride on the golf cart? And I said no. And he goes, Yeah, I noticed you keep saying no every time someone offers you a ride. And I say, Well, and I said, you know, after being a cripple for so many years, walking feels wonderful. And Mark, when you say the phrase walking feels wonderful, that's when I think most of the stuff will be fixed. Now, uh, as I look back on that particular discus camp, it was a while ago. I just remember every time I'd walk up and down the hills of Denison University there in Granville, Ohio, and the hills are steep there, every single time I felt like I was I was making progress. You know, speaking of Forrest Gump, you know, he, he runs out of his, uh, his leg uh, straps, you know, that's kind of how I felt almost every day. Um, that would have been, again, Oh, probably six months after the, the THR. Um, asymmetrical issues. Uh, every surgery I've had, uh, wrists, fingers, knee, uh, other places, uh, I, my surgeons have always told me I'm healing so quickly. And one of the reasons, and I'd like you to think about this, Mark, is I would train. So if I have a wrist surgery here, I would train the right arm, the legs, and my core as hard as I could working around the injury. Remember, if front squats are providing magical hormones, those magic hormones are also going into that recovering left wrist too, not just into the thighs, butt, lower back, or whatever. So, Mark, uh, keep me informed on how this is going. I'd like to hear. But whenever you're rehabbing from any surgery, I know yours is a THR, but you're doing the two, the smartest thing, going into a surgery, strive to get into the best condition you can, considering your limitations. Post-surgery, try to move within limitations and with approval, with doctor's approval, PT's approval, to get yourself to move. And then slowly, slowly nudge those barriers outward over time. Um, just like this, the question uh, we had about, you know, getting into, you know, uh, the lifting weights three days a week for four year, uh, f pardon me, lifting weights three days a week, you know, doing your sport four days a week for the next eight years. It's the same kind of thing. Memorize this little and often over the long haul little and often over the long haul. And that's true if you're talking about fat loss, relationships, education, elite discus throwing performance, or recovering from any injury. That's a good question. Thank you. Okay, so we have a question from Michael. Uh, it's always good to hear from Michael. Uh, I have a nephew named Michael. Michael asks a very simple, boom, and it's a very easy question for me to answer, very to the point. Um, and the thing I also like about it is it gives me a chance to uh, talk about that great podcast I had with Brett Contreras. Uh, I'm going to try to get on uh, a monthly call with Brett. There's a couple other people I'm going to start trying to have, uh, you know, monthly, other other monthly calls uh, with to talk. Uh, and by the way, if you have ideas of somebody you'd like me to talk with, now the thing is, a lot of a lot of big names in the industry will not be on a podcast with me on a regular basis. Sometimes, honestly, because they don't. Huh, okay, this sounds horrible. Not everybody who's famous on the social media things about fitness and training are actually truly in real life competent. They might have a good show, a good gig. Uh, they might have a good line, a little catchphrase, catchphrase, you know, 
I'm working on mine. You like that? I don't. Uh, but I think a guy like Brett Contreras, I'm thinking about Matt, I'm thinking about, you know, Boyle maybe, I'm thinking about some other people who would be an interesting monthly conversation, bi-monthly conversation, and would be able to, you know, keep, keep, keep resonating with the audience and keep, you know, expanding. Yeah, so that's what I would like. So, Michael, here's Michael's question. I loved your recent podcast with Brett Contreras, but I am curious why you are so interested in your hips and why nobody else incorporates hip movements like you and Brett do. Wow. Michael, it shocks me to see that. I mean, you know, you know, I always review the questions and I and I and I think about them a lot before I answer them. And I know I read that. And I, I guess it was reading it out loud that made me go, wow, the fact that nobody else incorporates hip movements like you and Brett do would make me want to say this to you, Michael, don't listen to anybody who doesn't. If people are not focusing on that hinge movement, fire them, get off their thing, stop buying their products, get away from their magic mojo. Yeah, maybe you'll look better on the beach. Uh, doing their programs than I will, or well, actually, you'll probably look better for your. Somebody told me the other day that for every photo they put up, they take three hundred to get one. Holy cow! You took three hundred pictures of me. I guarantee we'd find one that makes me look good. Uh, enough. I'm I'm good enough to. Yeah, man. Hey, listen, Michael. <laughs> the hips are the secret to success. When I was young, every book always had a picture of a guy like this, okay? And there was these concentric circles. Uh, you know, like when you drop a stone in a lake or a pond, and it goes boop, 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 boop. Well, right here, right there, right around the belly button was the first circle. And when I was young, we were taught that if it ain't it, your butt, your hips, your spine erector, those were the secrets. Your ab wall, your psoas family, and all those. Those, they all play together in this magical game of high performance. From there, of course, your thighs and your lats would be the next big ones to really focus on. And I, when I say thighs, I mean the whole family. And when I mean lats, uh, I would include any of the X's here. I wouldn't worry much about pecs as some people do, because of course I'm not a bodybuilder type, so maybe I don't, I'm not. And then of course, as you get to the calves, forearms, biceps, they become less and less important. Uh, there's a, there's a great book from about the University of Texas football program in the sixties called meat on the hoof, very unpopular book in Texas, um, where he talks about, he began to pick up as an athlete that, you know, guys with the big calves, guys with the big hamstrings, guys with the big butts are the guys who knock you down and hurt you. Uh, one of the things you pick up when you go to elite performance, speaking of, I just mentioned Steve-O, but when I first worked with him, he had the same kind of question. So I made him go to the Stanford Invitational, and he sent me back a very famous little uh, text message that said, butts, butts, butts. Elite performance, it can be seen in the butt. And of course, the stronger the butt is, generally, the better the ab wall looks. Um, you know, I'm, yeah, as I strive at, in my mid-60s to, to have a beach body, uh, uh, the best way to build the ab wall, weirdly, for a lot of people, is get the butt up first. And then the ab wall <clears throat> with dietary intervention uh, suddenly looks magnificent. Yeah, hey man, if people are not talking about, I don't know, I, of course, Brett made that line that I, I, is, a, is a million dollars to me. He said, uh, goblet squats is the jumping goblet squats like the hip thrust is to the kettlebell swing. And I thought to myself, uh, that's money. That is money. Um, if you're not doing the grind family with the hip thrust, most of the squat family, most of the deadlift family, the swing, the snatch, the clean, well, those, there you go. There's your perfect workout. Uh, even someone is, is, is uh, so Phil Maffetone has his golf training program and you can find it online or you can buy the book. But personally, I would just go online because the book basically just tells you this. He has you do a little warm up. And then you do a set of five in the squat. You rest two and a half minutes. You do a set of five in the deadlift. And I think you do that for five or seven rounds or something like that. Those are the only two exercises. 
squat and deadlift, squat and deadlift, squat and deadlift. And the reason he um, does it in that order is he believes you need uh, a longer rest period between squats and deadlifts. He says, whether this is true or not, I never followed this, these rules. God, people tell me they rest for five to seven minutes between the sets. I'm always like, God, what do you do for a life? Um, that's just that's just me. But you squat a set of five, you rest five minutes. You squat a set of five, you rest five minutes. Squat. Well, that's a, you know, doing that with squats and deadlifts would make a very long workout. Could be an amazing workout, but it'd be long. Um, you know, Maffy Tone is telling golfers to squat and deadlift. Um, of course, uh, Brett has completely, I think, uh, completely changed the world of female physique contestants because of his, his influence with the glute stuff. So, yeah, I, I, I would say, you know, hips, glutes, and let's go back again. So it's hip thrust, deadlift, swing, clean, snatch, squat family. Prowlers, sled pulls, hill sprints. I mean, those are all the million dollar exercises. And But here's the problem. They all take some discipline and dedication to learn. And those all have that, those are all the exercises that make you kind of go, whew, when you're done doing them. So that might be the reason they're not as popular. Uh, what benefit does adding glute and hip work add to normal weightlifting routines for someone who's in his mid-30s looking to get stronger and more athletic. Uh, let me say this as nicely as I can, and boy, this is like an interesting thing. I'm 65 years old, and people comment on how nice my butt looks. They do, and I blush. When you talk to a lot of women, they don't really notice my armacondas but they do notice the butt. The butt is almost universally uh, a symbol of health. Uh, if you have saggy bottom, soggy bottom, uh, it is generally a sign that you're not in um, the level of health that you should be. Um, for performance, Coach Steve-O said it better. Butts, butts, butts. Um, yes. So, oh, one thing, and I, if you don't mind, this is just a tiny little point. But I'm doing uh, the glute loop work, like the hip thrust and clamshell, before my Olympic lifting workouts now. Somebody told me I'm activating my glutes. I don't know if I'm doing that. But I tell you one thing. After you do your, your hip thrust and your clamshells, your, your Olympic lifts, the, the warm-ups feel smoother. Now, it could just be you did more warm-up, but they feel smoother and faster. And at my age, the glute is the symbol of youth. So I have to keep it up. Michael, I love this question. He, Michael's question is, why do Brett Contreras and I talk so much about the hips? Because it literally is the seat of power. It is the secret to your strength. Tommy Kono, the great American weightlifter in Mr. Universe, he talked about that in all of his books and all of his articles. Um, I don't know of a power lifter who would ever disagree. It's to, and to coach, you know, what Coach Steve-O said at Stanford Invitational is so true. Elite performance is butts, butts, butts. So if you can do your hip thrust, your clamshells, your squats, your swings, your, your hinge family, you're going to take care of business. And uh, I think in your 30s, you'll be glad you did it in your 40s, 50s, and 60s. Uh, I would put them as exercise number one right now. Uh, body part focus number one. Great question, Michael. And that's going to bring us to an end today. Um, we had a lot of good questions today. You guys got me thinking. You guys got me looking up some stuff for the podcast. Um, and anytime I can think, anytime I can expand, those are the questions I like the best. Remember, you have questions if you have questions. Email them to podcast at danjohnuniversity.com, and I'll do my best to answer each and every one. Um, it's always an honor to be here. And until next time, let's all keep on lifting and learning. Bye-bye.